Good afternoon, everyone. We are very honored and fortunate to have this really distinguished panel with us. Uh, on my right hand, obviously, we don't need a further introduction for Gary, for Mr. Wang, and also Mr. Xu. We just heard the two really fascinating, stimulating uh, uh, five stars. Right? So I would like to give each of you two minutes to see what is your common response for those very fascinating thoughts from history to the future. Gary, you start. Well, I, I, I thank our <coughs> two uh, fire starters. Um, I, I agree completely with what they've said. Um, you know, global trade is important. We've all won by trading with each other and playing to our natural strengths. And if we're going to be in a, tr in a trade war, and I'm not exactly sure we are in a trade war. I'd say we may be having a little skirmish, not a war. Uh, there will be no winners. There will only be losers in, in, the, in that situation. And, and ultimately, we have to just understand that to coexist and grow the globe and create job opportunities and wealth creation opportunities for everyone and make sure that we bring the lower class up, we have to trade with each other. We have to share goods and services. One thing that we don't talk a lot about when we're talking about this whole trade situation, we tend to talk about goods. and We tend to talk about balance of trade and, trade and goods. We don't talk about it in jobs and how many jobs have been exported around the world. That's a huge phenomena that you know, real-time connectivity and real-time communications have created. And we were given a 30-year perspective. And that's really an interesting perspective because in the last 30 years, you're able to have employees anywhere in the world connected to each other. So you take a city like Bangalore, which is back office to many of the largest companies in the world today, millions of jobs created there because they can be connected. That's another form of trade that goes under the radar screen, but it really helps develop a country, um, India, but it also helps um, companies around the world grow by getting resources in other parts of the world. So I'm in complete agreement with our, our, our two panelists on um, trade, the necessity of trade, the necessity to work it out, the necessity for countries to te treat each other fairly, and for all countries to open up to each other. That's good, yeah. Mr. Wang, please. Yeah, thank you, Mean. I, I think that we are really uh, facing a very uh, uh, dangerous uh, crossroad now. The world is really uh, at the crossroad, and we see the populism, the protectionism is, is uh, really rampant. And uh, so, what I think the, the will, 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 will lead that actually is that, of course, the trade has been really had a free ride for the last 75 years uh, since the Second World War, and then that produced many times of wealth, prosperity, and uh, flat world. However, that has now we are coming at the, at, at the crossroad is that we, you know, deglobalization is really taking, taking uh, uh, hold now. Uh, what I think that one of the problems was that. You know, the, the global governance is falling behind global practice because the, the, the infrastructure, I mean, U.S. has set up in the uh, Second World War is not, is not enough to cope with the existing uh, challenges and difficulties. Uh, for example, the World Bank has just released the World, World, World Bank report on global value chain. In the 80s and the 70s, 80 percent of the uh, product produced was of the country of origin. Now, 70, 80 percent of the product was produced by different countries altogether. So, for example, it's made by China, it's not really made by world. And they really, so, so, but then how we share that uh, benefit, multinationals and, and also uh, uh, host country uh, and home country has to really work hard. So global governance is not coped with this kind of new phenomena. I think that's really one of the reasons. Second is I think that we really have to work really hard is that to cope with uh, anti-globalization sentiment. For example, 1% of the wealth Sometimes in many countries, it's larger than the 90% of the population combined. So that's really not, not, not really a good result of this globalization. It's not inclusive. So we need to really get, 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 get that ratified. I think that is really important. Finally, I would like to make a few, uh, 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 just, just very quickly, my comments. I think we need to you know, strengthen the people-to-people -people exchanges anywhere, between China and the U.S. as well. Second, we actually, China just launched a, uh, you know, foreign investment law, I think, which is very good. China should continue to be open, open wider and faster. And, and higher, and that's that to welcome all the foreign company comes in without uh, any uh, re restriction. Thirdly, I think global governments we need to design. For example, TPP is a good example that has really done uh, well of 11 countries. Why can't we get TPP go global and then uh, it's always open, help welcome China and the US to come back? 
and to, to join that. And also we can you know, conclude RCEP. We may even have an FTAP for the Asia right. Pacific. And yeah. really, I think we need to change our narrative. Thank you. Mr. Xu. <laughs> uh, you insist that um, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not because of uh, strong, uh, but uh, we, have to, we have another choice. It is said by the Winston Churchill. Uh, I speak Chinese. It's uh, we are um, insisting uh, because we are uh, not because we are strong. No, that's okay. Uh, I see that um, the title is a "The World Flat" and uh, the Protectionism and Populism Review Creators. Uh, this reminds us that when we were uh, young, we thought that the world was flat, but when we grow older, we know that the world is actually um, a round um, place. So if you look at um, Beijing and Los Angeles, in a map, it's actually flat, but in, on the globe, it's actually uh, a round area. So it's the same in the economic life, trade protectionism and free trade. From uh, Since the inception of the free trade theory, uh, these two ideas have existed and uh, the rise or decrease in influence uh, at different times. When there's need, uh, there's uh, free trade uh, and uh, globalization, which went to upper hand when we developed to a certain stage. When the impact um, is adverse in terms of economy to a country, then there will be rising protectionism. And today, we are faced with these issues. We have no more choices. We have to confront it in a better way and try to find a solution to the problems or endure this Great. periodic issue. So we all agree trade is important. So we need to promote further strong trade and globalization. We all agree. I think it's good. Fred made this very clear. US and China should sign a trade deal, even phase one, as soon as possible. So Gary, you were in White House. Tell us, when will both U.S. and China will be able to sign a deal? So I, I've been gone from the White House for a while, so you know, no, no one should, should take anything I say as White House speaking. But look, I think it is in both sides' best interest to sign phase one immediately. You know, phase one is an agricultural deal for the United States, mm -hmm. where the United States will return to, to exporting agricultural products back to China with some market access for U.S. companies into China, that's a win-win for both co countries and something that I think should be done immediately. The farmers in the U.S. are suffering. Um, China needs to buy the agricultural products. They'll buy it from somebody. Right. It's not like China's buying something they don't need. So the U.S. might as well, might as well be the supplier uh, of, of choice. And getting access for U.S. companies into China is something that U.S. companies have been trying to do now for 20 plus years. Yeah, so it's, to it's me, this is, a, this is an easy thing to get done. Yeah. It's the easiest thing to, to be done, but we still take a year, so we cannot reach agreements. Why is that? Why both sides cannot sit down and sign deal? Well, as, as I think everyone's acutely aware, that we didn't break, or, or they didn't break, the trade agreement into phases till recently. Uh, I think they were trying to negotiate an all-encompassing trade deal, including agriculture, as well as intellectual property. Mm -hmm. I think the problems really stem out of the intellectual property part of the discussion, where the Americans feel that there has been substantial forced technology transfer, substantial copyright infringement um, go, that's happened in China. You can't put, put that back. You can't make that disappear. But the U.S. would like protection going forward, which is a lot of what we've been talking about here. We've been talking about the new technology revolution, the new technology iron curtain. I think everyone understands that having a level playing field in the world of technology isn't everyone's best interest. But the U.S. cannot be the creator of intellectual property. That's what we create and need to sell to the world. China can create goods and sell them to the rest. We'll pay for the goods as long as China pays for the intellectual property. No, IP protection is, a, is, is an important issue. And uh, in China, uh, President Xi announced a big open policy in the Boao last year and also emphasized the protection for the IP uh, uh, issues. So, Mr. Wang, 
Um, how do you see the progress in China in these areas and uh, what China can do more? Uh, you're right, I, absolutely. I think the, the President Xi has uh, emphasized not only abroad, but also recently at the China import expo in Shanghai. Uh, I think there's a lot of progress been really taking place that uh, is, is largely uh, undetected probably by, 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 by global media. Is that, for example, China Premier Li actually announced in Davos this year that the old foreign investment will be open a year ahead of the year uh, of the schedule. And now you have 100% ownership now in China. We have a lot of stories now. Tesla has a 100%, BMW increased to 75% ownership. There's many stories happening, you know, Standard Poor coming to China. So, so we, are, we are expecting a, a flood of actually foreign investment and, and the foreign uh, financial sector to come in. And then furthermore, I think the, uh, also that has been, uh, I, I noticed in the West media is the, China has just this year in March passed the new foreign investment law. And in that law, it stipulates that uh, there's no, you know, should not be allowed the first time you transfer. It should not be allowed uh, IPR violation. If violated, it would be severely punished, no matter who, government official included. Thirdly, is also all foreign companies should be treated equal. And then they, they recently, last month, the, the implementation detail of this uh, law has been circulating among the multinational AmChain European chambers. And by January 1st, this will be coming into play. So this is really exactly addressing the structural concerns mm -hmm. that our American friends have. So a I think we have a lot of things that's done already. A lot of progresses. So Mr. Xu, does trade fraction impact on your business? You do a lot of international business uh, trades across board transactions. Sure. Yes, indeed. It does have some impact on companies, but I feel that China-U.S. trade frictions, well, the impact is not just on the large companies in China. In particular, for the private sector companies, the impact is also not small, because China, the exporting companies um, in China, for instance, home appliance companies, furniture companies, um, they're there, and uh, for the large SOEs, their export to the U.S. is not so large as a share of their total, and this has an impact on Chinese companies and on foreign companies. The whole world is actually uneasy about the turbulence brought by the China-U.S. Uh, trade frictions. same thing, U.S.-China should sign deal as soon as possible, but at this particular moment, Fred, are you optimistic? or you are pessimistic about the deal coming soon? Well, by nature, I'm an optimist. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's difficult, it's challenging. Not For this like particular issue, are you? I'm sorry? For this particular issue? Of the trade dispute. Trade deal, yeah. Yeah, so I'm an optimist. Um, you know, just as <coughs> you know, Gary pointed out, right, it's definitely in two countries' interest. You know, uh, a protracted war, it's lose-lose for everyone and for the world economy as, you know, cultural damage. So, you know, that will be uh, incentive will powerful enough for us to end this, um, this, this fight. I would also just make a quick comment. You know, obviously, you know, uh, we couldn't uh, know <coughs> what uh, ultimately Washington, uh, in the politics in place or, you know, the personalities uh, in place to end this trade fight. But I think as far as China is concerned, you know, we, uh, my conditions that we should go unilateralist. What do I mean? Unilateralist, learn from America. However, not by, you know, raising tariffs. You know, I feel, you know, a little so certain. You know, when the first uh, shot of trade war happened the last year, you know, we obviously, understandably, human nature, responded by raising our own tariff. It's like Washington shot at their own one foot and we shot at the other foot in the name of retaliation. So we should, this kind of tit for tat, with territory tariff, I think is uh, counterproductive. Uh, we're better off uh, unilaterally um, reducing our tariff rates, removing non-tariff trading barriers, <coughs> open up marks further for foreign trade and the investment, and importantly, improve our record of IP protection. On IP specifically, it's such a light, rotten issue. The fact is China has made significant, tremendous progress uh, on IP protection. Why? If any doubt in Washington, because China itself has emerged as an innovator. So we have skin in the game, our interests are aligned. If China ignores IP protection, China will never become a world-class innovative nation. 
So we are aligned, uh, and I think actually we can get a deal done. The progress of China is making an open the policy, including open international competition, and also RP protection. In this particular moment, are you optimistic about the deal coming soon, or you're not? Look, I, I'm optimistic about a phase one deal coming. A uh, phase one deal, uh -huh. Yeah, F phase one, I think, is, is, a, is a relatively easy deal to mm -hmm. get done. Phase two, I think, is much more difficult to get done. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I pick up on something Fred said. You know, I, look, China has become much more of a technology-driven country. Mm -hmm. um, over the last decade or two, and I think Bill Gates said it yesterday, you know, he was visiting uh, the Microsoft Center here on AI, and he doesn't know if it's Chinese technology or American technology, technology is technology. But if you think of what's going on in China today, in some areas, their technology is probably way ahead of where the United States is. I would think that China's at the point in their evolution that they would want IP protection as well, because they're now starting to develop some real cutting edge intellectual property, and they don't want the rest of the world stealing it from them. No, that's very true, because uh, we, the Chinese, grow up the value chain, IP protection become ever important, exactly as said. But you also mentioned the, the, the technology and innovation movements in China. And we also observe the trade fraction more move to the tech fraction now, and uh, they're not. Are you really concerned about the trade fraction will move to tech fraction? Absolutely. We Do you have see things moving to that direction? We have to acknowledge and be honest with ourselves that this is an all-encompassing geopolitical confrontation between the existing superpower and the aspiring one. And trade, if you'd like, is the least contentious issue. Certain intellectual property rights, I'll, I'll agree, Gary, and also opening China's financial sector. But when it comes to tech, it gets really difficult because in no other point in history before this, when we've had these confrontations between an existing and an aspiring superpower, were we in, in a position of having a technology, especially with the deployment of 5G, that will weaponize how economic structures work. And I'm not talking about weaponizing tariffs. What I'm talking about is that if I ask every single one of you in the room here, would the US have been buying the bulk of its military equipment from the Soviet Union during the Cold War, well, the answer would be, I'm sure, unanimous. And yet, in the future, if we actually make, uh, manage to build it, because, of course, this decoupling will slow innovation and technology, we could be in a position where just turning off someone's electricity system is a weapon. Mm -hmm. Obviously, Compromising yeah. communication channels is a weapon. So on the technology front, I really don't see, I see probably 5% chance of the US and China actually agreeing common technology, global, digital standards. Let me just tell you one other thing, wow. though. Well, stop there. You mentioned 5% okay. chance for both US and China to work out a common technology standard. That was uh, quite uh, scary and concerning for everyone in this room, I'm sure, because the world cannot so, uh, stand for two different tax standards. I think this is obviously. What can we do, Mr. Wong, well, to I narrow this issue? Absolutely, this is re really dangerous. Uh, the trade was, I think, on, on the surface, but really the, the digital and the technology divide, that's really <laughs> going to hurt and divide the world into two camps. And that's going to put us all into primitive days and uh, we'll lower the productivity and, and we'll suffer probably even great recessions. For example, even though if we can use the 5G of, of Huawei, which is the most advanced uh, uh, applicable many times in China, uh, you know, perfect many times uh, the most advanced technology, and then even uh, uh, Nokia or uh, Ericsson, their 5G equipment was still made in China, if they think of an alternative. So if we don't use that, then we'll be so many generations behind. But does that mean in the future, Chinese people don't want to use Boeing? I mean, may, maybe there's a bug in the plan? Or all the U.S. Uh, GM4 sells more cars in China than the United States? 
Uh, Chinese people refuse to ride on the, on the US-made cars. So this is ridiculous. If we think about it, if we, if we really widen that into, into this kind of narrative or, or mentality, that would really in the tech war, and then it would be cyber war, there would be a, a, a currency war, talent war, and then the world would be finished, and then we, we may not have a military war, but we will be, have many times over by those kind of different type of wars. We don't want to get all those wars, that's very true. Commercially, the chip market have a roughly $480 billion per year. China imported roughly $310 billion. So if there's a tree fraction stop the chip export to China, I think the whole global tech chip industry will immediately broke down. So there's a huge uh, a commercial and a business interest in there. So business community is really don't want to see that happen. But Fred, you do a lot of investments in the tech sector in both the US and China. How do you see these issues? How do, how do you see we can try to solve these issues and prevent this tech war happen? Right, so could it be you know, where in unprecedented times, you know, there's a really gathering dark clouds on the horizon uh, facing uh, the technology sector and the relation between US and China. I will offer just three quick points. You know, first of all, uh, uh, technology, um, you know, is really, uh, um, uh, you know, China has been making a lot of uh, progress in terms of closing the gap uh, with the US, but the US remains the undisputed global leader uh, in science and technology overall. So what I worry is that right now there's a bit of paranoia, you know, in the policy cycle, certainly in Washington, so that may misguide some of the policies that they're having, number one. Number two, um, you know, we are, thanks in part to US, um, you know, being a champion of global trading system, you know, there's, you know, global supply chain, very elaborate, sophisticated, and, uh, and, and dedicated. So, yes, US may, uh, China may have some success in hardware gadgets, including Huawei, but 90% of chips uh, are imported from the US, and all the software always are from the US. So it's kind of symbolic mutual dependence uh, to force decoupling. Yes, in the short term, China will take a hit, but also hurt the US semiconductors and software companies. It so is one tech supply chain indeed. Gary, are you concerned about tech war in addition to the trade war? Look, I, I, I think the trade war is going to morph into a tech war. More I mean, that, 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 that's where we're headed. The, the trade part of this is easy to solve. I mean, mm. there's all right. winners in the trade part of the equation. And I think right. this has been pointed out, you know, we all win from economies of scale and playing to our natural strength. Certain countries are better at manufacturing certain goods or services than other countries, and they should export to those other countries. That's a win-win-win. No, one, no one's going to argue that. So, right. so we've seen basically 30 years of that. We've seen what it's done to poverty levels. We've seen what it's done to electrification in, in, in the world. That part of the equation is relatively easy to see. When it comes down to the technology side of the equation, this is going to be where all of the difficult decisions are made because it's not going to be China versus the U.S. Because things are going to be de developed in the blockchain. The blockchain is going to create things. The cloud is going to create things. Where does the blockchain exist? Where does the cloud exist? It doesn't exist in China. It doesn't exist in the United States. And that's when this is going to get very difficult as, as, as sovereign nations try and protect sort of their, their right. technology or, or their cyber world. That's when it gets really difficult. The, 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 the goods and services, it's this easier. is easy yeah, stuff right, to fix. Right. But also that provide opportunity for both sides and for the whole world to work together, right? To figure out the, the new tech architecture for the whole world and governance structure as well. Yeah, the, yeah. The, the, it, it, it has been said many times in this room, the world will be much stronger if we work together yeah, on one that. single platform. Yeah, yeah. If we work on divided platforms, someone's going to fail miserably. Right, this is a much more serious issue Diana gave us the most uh, miserable forecast, but I'll come back to the issue. <laughs> now, Mr. Wong, you mentioned the supply chain. Yeah. What that happened is, I mean, if you're looking for last year, FDI dropped dramatically from roughly 2017, $1.46 trillion to $1.2 trillion. 
20% drop this year so far up to today, another 9% FDI drops. So that means the tree fraction brings a huge uncertainty and sort of a slow down investment, slow down the, the supply chain. Do you see the supply chain will change or do you see the supply chain will continue with the globalization? What, what, as I also mentioned yesterday, we probably see deglobalization from the global, uh, you know, working together to the regionalism. So we may, we may see the globalization may be breaking into several parts. We have a NAFTA, we have a US uh, MSC, and then we have uh, ASEAN, China, <laughs> you know, Southeast Asia, India, and Asia is, is emerging with, within itself. China is the largest trading partner with all its neighboring countries. And then we see EU probably getting together. So, so we, may go, we may go back to the romance of three kingdoms. And then we, we have to really compete on a continental basis. And that is the, you know, where I think China still has some advantage because China has the largest uh, uh, you know, uh, homogeneous market, 1.4 billion people, 400 to 500 million middle class market, also uh, the 1 billion smartphone users, the best infrastructure, uh, health, you know, l l largest uh, speed rail networks in China. So there's a tendency moving from globalization to the regionalization. That's, that's right. To the regional supply chain. Diana, are you concerned the global supply chain were broken down? Absolutely. But I think it will be an inevitable consequence of what we're seeing. Inevitable. And though the results oh. is going to be higher cost push inflation, slowdown in technological advance and innovation, and also, I think what's extremely important to recognize is that we talked about free trade in goods, and I wouldn't say we have had free trade in services, so that was necessary, but the failure was in the last 20 years that we didn't have the free movement of capital. And China is opening inwards it absolutely must open outwards and allow market forces to determine the exchange rate and its interest rates. It would have been a very different global story in, in, if in 2004, 2005, <coughs> China had actually done that. I would even argue that we would not have had the global financial crisis. Well, that's another point of both enjoy the domestic reform and also reforming the global supply chain. We still have a few minutes left. I think this is a, such an issue in everybody's mind. Everybody in the room can talk a half a day. Is there any questions and comments anybody want to raise or raise your hands? <laughs> See what, yes. George, do I have a Mac? Do I have a Mac? No Mac. Do I have a Mac or? Or we're not. Oh, Mac is coming, George. Yes, please. Mm. I come out of these two days as a European and an American, as the impression that Europe is completely evacuated from this <laughs> debate. Ah. <laughs> so, with all this talk about US and China, where's yeah. uh, Europe? So, yeah, you're paying, please. So, my question is, no. Is there still enough strength in Europe to constitute sometimes, I wouldn't say a buffer, but another pole of growth that would be sufficiently important to play a role and avoid the bipolarization, not so much of the tech world, but of the international trade? Very important point, the role of Europe in this, not only trade fraction, but globalization. So, I, Diana, I, no, 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 Fred, Diana <laughs> come from Europe. Let's ask Diana talk first. Yes, please. Yes, I do come from Europe, and it's very sad where Europe is, and we have to acknowledge two things. First of all, that in the technology race, it really is China and the U.S., Everyone else is so far behind, there's no way they're catching up, so there's no multipolar world emerging out of this. But also in the European case, we really have to acknowledge that without a political union, this euro area is not working. And so I throw the question back to you. Are we going to have a political union? No. Yeah, okay. That's also <laughs> or maybe that's we'll not done throwing the question back. <laughs> so that, but, but that Brad, is, 
Yeah. That that is like I I would I would have answered the question the exact same way. Uh huh. I think you would in a normal functioning globe with with certain powerful regions. If the U.S. and China were fighting, someone would try and fill the void. You know who would fill the void? You know you've got India. They're, they're, they're still in this hyper growth wave. You've got Brazil going, Brazil, Latin America going the other way. So Europe would be the natural respondent here. Right. But I agree completely. You know, in the words of Jean Claude Trichet, they're still seeing if this experiment, those are his words, not mine, if this experiment of the Eurozone is working. And it seems to me that the experiment is failing miserably because there's a huge opportunity, there's a huge void to be filled and Europe should be filling it, but they can't even figure out how to create economic growth in a negative interest rate world in Europe right now. So filling a void seems far off their radar screen. So that's a challenge. Fred, you want to jump in. Uh, also, before that, you mentioned the WTO minor one. Does that mean China Europe should form a new WTO without the United States? What is your WTO no, minor no, what one? Means, what so is the role of a Europe in this globalization? So far from being neglect the European's rule, I think European's essential, especially when you know, the architect of the trading system is turning its back against the, you know, the system. So it's very important for Europe, uh, China, Japan, you know, ca Canada, and India, and uh, Brazil, many countries working together, just like what they have done in the Paris Treaty on climate change. So I, I mentioned I didn't neglect Europe, I said that solidarity matters. Europe has very big role to play. By the way, as Asian, I'm not as pacific as you, European about Europe. I think Europe has a big role to play. Uh, you know, in terms of WTO, you, you know, the stake is very high. European Union may be a big market, but the demographics and the political arrangement, as Gary mentioned, the monetary. So Europe need uh, China, Asia, and the WTO multilateral system to work, to function. Once again, what the Europe and China can jointly Build the WTO minor one, as you mentioned in your opening remark. No, the way it's not to include the US, it's very much like a TPP. If at this particular moment, Washington choose to opt out, let it be. So the rest of the 11 countries you know, still have TPP. So WTO is not about excluding the architect, which is the United States. You know, but at this particular moment, China, Europe, you know, the rest of the world should unite to reform, strengthen WTO, I'm sure you know, Washington will change his mind to come back. Fantastic point. Yes, please, gentlemen. Mr. Min, uh, I'm from Australia, so I feel a long way away from this uh, Okay, these another, issues. another continent. But, but my comment, and, and I, I echo Henry Kissinger here, who twice at this conference has called for a different language for, for these discussions. I've heard so many uh, uh, analogies to war, to skirmishes, to the foothills of the next Cold War, to the the, uh, you know, the trade iron curtain or the silicon curtain. And I do really think that it behoves the leaders of the world to find a better and, and more respectful dialogue and uh, to avoid the, uh, the, the battle cries that we're hearing so much of at the moment. Yeah, Australia, a most beautiful and a peaceful country is want to have a peaceful solution. Don't even mention the, the concept of the war. That's a fantastic idea. Any other comments or questions or in the room, people want to raise your hands, the last one? Oh, we have a lady here, fantastic. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, you talked about globalism moving into regionalism. And I think I agree that there are certain issues that can be built better, dealt better by regionalism, for instance, uh, cross-border movement of um, contaminated air. I know Europe has a treaty, regional treaty on this. Also, maybe fishing in certain sea area, and there are institutions to take care of that. Uh, but there are issues that can be dealt much better, as we all know, by globalism rather than regionalism. Uh, climate change is one, and I think trade is another. Uh, you have talked about moving into regionalism as though this is, that is easy. But for most Asian countries, the U.S., China is a big trader, but the U.S. is for most Asian countries the second largest trader. 
And for some countries, they trade equally, just about equally between China and the US, with China and the US. So you cannot, on, on trade, on, on the economic sphere, you cannot just move into regionalism. Mm -hmm. It is an economic imperative that um, both Eurasia and the US, the Pacific is the bridge, and the two continents have to be together. So I just would like to get your view on, on so this. So we need a both reg regionalism and also globalism work yeah. together. I think that's also important. Now, no, no, I we don't have the time, time to left, uh, but I would like to take roughly five minutes, give everyone one minute to looking forward in 2020 in terms of uh, trade, in terms of uh, globalization. Do you think we'll be happy, have a better year 2020, things can move forward? You think we'll have more challenges way ahead of us? We'll start with Mr. Xu. I cannot predict 2020, but I think uh, there's something that uh, 2020 in this year we have to do. We have talked a lot about challenges and issues, but what is important is how to prevent these issues and problems from happening. For example, technical war and uh, trade war, for us, businesses and, and um, think tanks. We need to find a way to support government's uh, policies to avoid so-called trade wars that we do not want to see. Wang Xianxian. We definitely want to for go for global. I mean, uh, it's just at, at the current stage, if, if we really have to break into the, uh, the you know, Cold War, then maybe regional is, is the first step to rebuild the globalism. For example, TPP, RCEP, and all those things is really good. I think then, if that is uh, uh, get accepted among the countries, we can enlarge that. We can have, have FTAP, for example. So I think, that, you know, let's also not forget we have G20, we have Australia, Japan, every country is inside. And also we have G7, I mean, what, can we have a G8, we, including China, and also a G9, G10. So I think we need to really think about that. We have, we have uh, many, uh, you know, common challenges. You now we are, we are exploring the outer space. So absolutely, we have to work together. And then the only we are in the same boat <laughs> of this planet, and we have to really survive Fred? for each other. 2020? What? You are asking 2020? Yeah. Um, you know, the twin negative force of protectionism, populism has taken the world economy to such a rock bottom. So look next year, I can only feel optimistic since it cannot get much worse and only there's upward to look for. Beautiful, Diana. For full disclosure, I am a glass half full person. Uh. And if I was a policymaker, I will be using a different language. But as a forecaster, I see 2020 and 2021 as really dangerous years. We have two different voices from podium. But so, <laughs> Gary, you're the right person to okay. conclude. So what is I'll, your 2020? I'm going to try and tie a bunch of concepts together here over the last couple of days. Trade really revolves around mm -hmm. four main concepts. Education, which is basically creativity and in, in, innovation. Capital, available of cap, availability of capital and cost of capital. Labor, availability of labor and cost of labor. And climate. Those are the four factors that really drive. If you've got a competitive advantage in one of those areas, you can out-trade someone. Mm -hmm. If you've got a competitive advantage in multiple of those areas, you could really out-trade somebody. If you tell me those areas are going to change, I'll tell you how optimistic or pessimistic I'm going to be. I don't, the one I see that there's probably the greatest agreement on, but the hardest to fix mm -hmm. is climate. Okay. So as much as we all agree on climate, well, most of us agree on climate, um, <laughs> it's the hardest to fix, as we saw by the unbelievable graphics that went up yesterday, how difficult it is to change one degree C. That's the one that's hard to change. The others are very, very difficult to change. I don't see a big change going on, so therefore I continue to see that we will continue to have fights 
because people will leverage their unfair or their competitive advantage in the world to try and grow their country at the expense of another country. Wow. I think we had a really, really fascinating talk. I think uh, the point is very clear. And before we move into more further sort of tech fraction, financial fractions, I think we should take this uh, trade fraction seriously. Both the US and China should sign the deal as soon as possible. I think that's all the view from panelists makes it very clear. And I think that's number one. And number two, the globalization is for the whole world. It's not only US and China. The Europe is also important. Australia is also important. We need to bring the whole world work together. Looking for 2020, we do have, have a different views about the future. But I think as Mr. Xu and Gary pointed out, let's grab the key issues, start working on it, so we will be able to create a better year in year 2020. Please join me, big hands for our excellent, excellent panelists.